Dr. Washington and I'll be teaching you about the scientific revolution. Before we begin I have to explain to you how the universe works. As you can see from the image above, the Earth sits in the center of the universe. It does not move, ever. The other planets all move in a circle around it. The Sun is the fourth planet away from Earth, and it moves in a circle around too. The stars are all in a ball that exists beyond the other planets. That makes perfect sense, right? Right? No? You don't agree? Well, maybe this will help explain it. You see, it is very simple, the Earth is in the middle and all the planets are spinning around it. I know some people will try to say that the Earth is moving too, but that is ridiculous. I mean come on, I'm standing right here on the Earth and I don't feel it moving. I'm an adult and a teacher, I must be right. You're just kids, what could you possibly know? Okay, now that you know what it was like to live before the scientific revolution, let me admit I made that all up. Of course the Earth moves, and of course the Sun is in the middle. I just wanted you to see what the early scientists had to deal with. A revolution is a dramatic, meaning huge, change. It is like doing the total opposite of what you were doing before. Science changed from what people thought to what they observed. Instead of just saying something because it made sense, they took the time to see it for themselves. They started doing actual experiments to test their ideas. Can you imagine science without experiments? The church is already fighting a war of ideas with the ongoing Protestant Reformation. The Congregation of the Inquisition is established in 1542 to suppress heretical ideas and police Catholic theology. Macabre devices such as the rack are used to extract confessions. Torture techniques like strapado, where the hands of the accused are tied behind their back as they're hoisted until their shoulders dislocate, lends additional persuasion to the unlucky accused. There is probably in all of human history nothing quite as terrifying as an interrogation in, in the in Inquisition. You start with the premise that you're guilty, and it's just a question of whether you can come to appreciate your guilt. One of the first thinkers to advocate heliocentrism is an outspoken monk named Giordano Bruno. Not only does Bruno embrace the sun as the center of our solar system, he believes in an infinite number of solar systems. In 1600, the Inquisition deals with him harshly. Giordano Bruno is declared to be a heretic, and he is not willing to compromise in any way with this belief. He asserts it to be truth, and he is tried, convicted, and burned at the stake. After Bruno is executed, many feel it's too dangerous to contradict church doctrine. These new scientists were challenging hundreds of years of tradition. Tradition that had come from the church. It was the church, for example, who taught that the earth was in the center and did not move. The church did not appreciate these scientists challenging them. They threatened the scientists with excommunication and even death if they did not follow the teachings of the church. The question really became about truth. The scientists could just stay quiet and ignore what they believed was true, or, like in the movie The Matrix, they could take the red pill and explore new ideas and really a whole new world. Most people kept their mouths shut, but a few brave men pushed science forward. Oh man, I love this song. If these men were going to start a new way of study, they needed some rules, so they created the scientific method. Before this science was simple. You just took whatever the church said was true and accepted it. The scientific method though, says first you come up with an idea or hypothesis. Then, you go out into the world and observe how things happen. Then, when possible, you design an experiment and test your idea out. Galileo's Italy of the 17th century is a far different place than today. The country is divided into autonomous city-states in the north, papal-controlled territory in the center, and monarch-ruled kingdoms in the south. In this overwhelmingly Catholic land, 
The Pope holds authority over all. But the church is being tested by a new age of discovery. The 1600s are a time of tremendous tension and intellectual ferment. You have on the one hand the traditional sense of the order of the universe enforced by the church, and you have all these new discoveries. You have the discovery of the new world. You have new instruments. You have new techniques. You have new industries. In spite of the innovations of the era, the ancient teachings of Aristotle, dating back to the fourth century BC, are the bedrock of conventional wisdom. Aristotle's view of the heavens puts Earth at the center, with the stars and planets revolving around it. This geocentric worldview seems to be supported by the Bible. The Bible makes reference to the Earth having been created and set on its foundation not to be moved forever. By the time you, you reach the age of Galileo, Aristotle has been the platform for knowledge for centuries. When somebody has been presented for such a long period as the ultimate authority in absolutely everything, um, it takes a lot of work to take that apart. The first person to present a viable alternative to Aristotle's geocentric worldview is a Polish astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus. In 1543, he proposes a heliocentric view of the world, with the sun, not the Earth, at the center. 